Welcome back. Uh, we've got some very good questions today, and um, I want to spend a lot of time on them. They're very important. They have to do with uh, diet and with uh, um, some other supplement um, injections. So let's spend some time on these. Um, the first one is, Annette asks, I've been doing mistletoe injections since last November. Are they contraindicated when I take the Velasto or do I even need to take this anymore, the other multiples and the other multiple supplements? I will probably stay on the low dose naltroxone, vitamin D, beta glucan. You said you weren't familiar with Quirk. It is from the Budwig uh, protocol. A chemical reaction occurs when you mix the quirk or cottage cheese with flaxseed oil, which chemical reaction then somehow can kill the cancer cell. Would, it, would be curious what your thoughts are on this combination. Um, let, let me try these first. <clears throat> the mistletoe injections, mistletoe has been around for, I don't know, a thousand years. It was one of the an very first anti-inflammatories that was done from um, actually medieval times. Depends on what kind of tree, what kind of quality it is that you're using. Um, but it's simply a um, anti-inflammatory. The, um, the real issue here is what is the, what's called the ORAC score of the mistletoe. And ORAC stands for Oxygen Radical Adsorption Coefficient. And um, mistletoe may be an uh, anti-inflammatory, but it's fairly low on the ORAC score. It's actually lower than vitamin C. So um, vitamin, uh, the, the Velasta is 6,000 times more potent than vitamin C. So you can see where it, it sets. If you're using it as an anti-inflammatory, there's nothing really that uh, compares to Velasta. The, the uh, mistletoe injections are fairly risky because obviously they're injecting something into your art into your veins or arteries um, so that always bothers me in that it's not quite natural when they have to stick a needle in you um, uh, on the quark the uh, the quark is basically a, a a fungus or a yeast in the cottage cheese um, there's a lot of work that's being done right now trying to figure out why it works sometimes and why it apparently doesn't work others. Um, but anytime that we end up with a question uh, that says that um, which chemical reaction then somehow can kill the cancer cell. Whenever I see somehow or I don't know or uh, it just, it, it's a miracle, I get very, very nervous about that because there's not enough known about it because you should be able to answer that question on everything that you're putting in your body. If you can't understand what it is you're treating for and how it's treating it, then I would be very reluctant to add anything. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, I'm st still not understanding if IV vitamin C also kills cancer cells, why you wouldn't feel it's okay to use it along with the Velasta. You can use um, vitamin C IV. It's just so low on the, um, on the anti-inflammatory scale compared to Velasta. It's not needed. It, it really does nothing. Uh, it might be contribute one part out of 100 when you're taking Velasta. But the, the downside of it is that it will be metabolized in your liver and will potentially uh, cause some inflammation in your liver. Unlike Velasta, it does not. So the risk versus benefit analysis of using vitamin C when you can replace it with Velasta is by far uh, favored towards Velasta because there is no risk to date of the Velasca, uh, of the Velasta. Um, even though you say it's hard on the liver and kidneys, um, isn't anything extra that helps kill cancer a good thing when using the Velasta? Mm, you, you've got to weigh the downside of what you're using. The, the risk 
of doing IV vitamin C um, would be negated by the fact that you're using Velasta. It's, it's, unless you, you're suffering from scurvy or a lack of vitamin C, ascorbic acid, um, there's nothing that even comes close. Velasta is 6,000 times more potent as an anti-inflammatory than vitamin C. Uh, are you familiar with the Signaterra blood test looking for a person, person's tumor's DNA to check for early reoccurrence or response to treatment? I had to have 28 rounds of radiation to my pelvis to control bleeding from endometrial cancer that had invaded my bladder a year ago. For five months, no sign of recurrence, but recent tests picked up my tumor's DNA. Since I don't know yet where the recurrence is coming from, how will I know the Velasta is working as compared to tumors that might show obvious changes of die-off? All my inflammatory markers are all very low, so I don't think I can count on any changes there. I do not believe this is a new cancer related to the radiation, yet anyway, as the blood test picked up my original tumor's DNA. Um, the Signaterra can pick up the DNA of cancer cells. Now let's talk about where that DNA comes from. Um, Typically, it's um, released by the cancer cell upon death, ne uh, necros uh, necrosis, or some other um, uh, attack on the cancer cell that causes the cell wall to rupture and release the cancer cell guts into your bloodstream. So, this test will show positive even if you have uh, dead cancer cells or your body has attacked cancer cells and released that material into your bloodstream. That material is not an indicator of live viable cancer cells. It's only an indicator that the DNA is, is present. Uh, most people who do not uh, present with a tumor uh, do generate cancer cells, but the moment the T cells take it out, the, um, and the cancer cells are torn apart, the, you could show this high Signaterra signature and it, it uh, puts some fear into the oncologist because their whole focus is if they see the DNA of a cancer cell, you've got cancer. That is totally wrong. There's a disconnect there, there's a other reasons that you could be showing a positive for uh, cancer tumor type DNA other than having viable cancer. So be very, very careful with acting aggressively strictly from the Signaterra blood test. You may be perfectly fine. All your other uh, cancer CA numbers might be in line, but don't rely on this one test to all of a sudden jump into chemo or radiation or something that's going to harm you. Mike asks, I was told to take five squares a day when I had cancer. I no longer have it. You would still recommend that dosage? I'm just looking to take it for my joints now. Uh, no, once your, um, once your disease has been uh, eradicated, the dosage can be reduced. If you're looking for joint pain, arthritis in the joints, um, my rule of thumb is if you were taking five squares a day and you no longer have the disease, cut it to two squares a day. Wait three to seven days, see if your joint pain um, comes back. Um, if you're still having joint pain, then I would stay at this dose until that pain goes away. But once you are no longer presenting the symptoms of the disease, cut it in half and then measure your C-reactive protein periodically. If that number stays below three, stay on the minimal dose. If that number pops above three, increase the dose. So we now have a mechanism to dose according to um, your disease uh, uh, presentation. I hope that helps, Mike. Jim asks, how does Velasta help blood pressure? What is the mechanism and why does it not stop all high blood pressure problems? Very, very good question. 
Um, let's go through a little bit on what typically causes high blood pressure. Um, it's usually found in what's called the, the um, angiotensin II renin uh, pathway. And um, oftentimes, anytime your angiotensin levels uh, increase from stress, oxidative stress, um, it will cause an elevation uh, in an, or a constriction even in the arterial wall. This constriction results in inflammation of the endothelial cells in the artery inner surface of, of, the, of the walls. That inflammation then causes further decline in more inflammation and more restriction of the uh, vascular wall. Um, when that happens, you now pump out more angiotensin. And the more angiotensin, the more constrictive your blood vessels become. And the more pressure builds up, the more pressure, the more inflammation. So you've got to break that cycle. Velasta breaks that cycle by stopping the inflammation re resulting from an angiotensin renin pathway attack. So um, look at your, again, your C-reactive protein. Make sure that you can keep it low. But anytime that we can eliminate the hydroxyl or the um, uh, nitrite free radical, which is typically what sparks the uh, angiotensin attack, then um, the blood pressure will, your, your arteries will tend to relax. They'll sort of come, uh, dilate. Your blood pressure will drop. But there's one thing that I want everybody to understand because most undiagnosed hypertension is caused from a virus. And that virus is called the um, cytomegalovirus, um, CMV. You can Google it, you can look it up. And one of the things that we're finding with people who have CMV, CMV is a herpes-based virus, comes from chickenpox, mononucleosis. Anyone who has had these diseases will have this virus for the rest of their life. It lives in the spinal fluid, typically at the base of the brain. And when it comes out, it causes a, uh, a, a stress cycle and um, that, that will release more angiotensin. So uh, uh, blood pressure medications are, are usually give, given amlodipine, um, metropolol. Um, but one of the things that we have found is simply taking a daily dose of Valtrex, an antiviral, has a tendency to reduce the presence or the presentation of the CMV virus and hence reduces your, uh, your hypertension. We see a definite benefit in as much as 40 points um, simply by taking Valtrex. So that's something that you might want to talk to your doctor about. And it, it apparently does work, but you can uh, look up uh, NIH and CMV and hypertension. And those research papers will pop up. Um, if you if you want those links, I, I can find them also. I probably have them in the library. But um, keep that in mind. If you've had mononucleosis, if you've had uh, fever blisters, herpes type 2 um, type viruses, that is probably an indicator as we get older, uh, the CMV will have a tendency to come out. Our immune system breaks down slightly which makes it more prevalent, and we'll start to see these hypertension problems arise. Joyce asks, I take Velasta 10 pumps and have for three years post-cancer diagnosis. No change in weight or diet. My high sensitivity CRP 4.2 up from 2.8 in May. No infection scans clean for cancer. Why can I not get my CRP under one? Um, there, there's a number of reasons. It, it depends on your stress level. It depends on your diet, um, your weight, whether you smoke, whether you're eating a lot of fruit uh, or consuming a lot of alcohol. 
So there's a number of reasons that this can be, but typically it's oxidative stress, um, and we've got to get that number down. Uh, the, the Velasta itself should knock it unless uh, the rate at which you are adding free radicals exceeds the rate at which Velasta can get rid of them. At that point, you see this sort of a, a slight fluctuation. It also depends on your your hydration level when they take the blood sample. So make sure you're very well hydrated uh, before you go in and, and give blood. She also states, I have been diagnosed with familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, typically, what that means is that you have high cholesterol, and it can be a genetic predisposition for that. Uh, vertical testing of cholesterol is done, and I have elevated APOB. I understand genetic. Uh, APOB is the protein that um, moves LDL cholesterol. So uh, the higher that number is, typically the higher your LDL number is. So, so, so let me just stop there and, and deal with this. Uh, just because you have a good a genetic predisposition doesn't mean that you will 100% uh, have this disease attributed to, you know, that you're going to get this, this, um, this disease. But there's several things. Typically, the ways to, to mitigate this is people who have this predisposition have to get their weight under control. So um, uh, typically, um, obesity is an issue, um, high sugar intake, high fructose intake. That's what causes LDL cholesterol. So if you can lower your LDL cholesterol, the protein that moves the LDL cholesterol will slowly diminish. So your APOB will start to drop. The real problem here is not managing your LDL cholesterol. A couple things, your, your medical doctor is gonna tell you to take out all meats, fats and oils. Typically that's, that's not it, it's, it's fruit, it's fructose related. So if you have a diet high in high fructose corn syrup or fruit, that contributes directly to LDL cholesterol. And since you have a predisposition the fruit, the fructose that you consume is going to convert it into triglycerides and then your body, for whatever reason, is very good at converting the triglycerides into LDL cholesterol. The higher your LDL cholesterol goes, the more APOB protein is going to be uh, required by your body and it's going to show as a high level. So you, you really need to focus on how to get that cholesterol number down uh, through diet. And my suggestions would be more vegetable. I'm not too concerned about chicken or fish or anything like that from the meat perspective. Um, but no fruit or sugar. That's the primary cause of these types of, um, of issues. Says I am followed by holistic doctor, diet, weight, blood pressure, exercise, all being followed and are good. I have this high sensitivity CRP done every three months. My number is 2.4 to 4.8, back and forth. Should I be concerned about this fluctuation? In some cases, that's, um, that's statistical variation. Um, it depends on when you get your blood samples pulled again. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, you can also go up about 20% in the Velasta, and it'll start to moderate that HSCRP. Um, when it comes to um, exercise, stay aerobic, no anaerobic exercises. Don't do anything to muscle exhaustion, because every time you tear a muscle down and the muscle cells die, that creates an inflammatory response and the new muscle cells tissue will be rebuilt, hopefully stronger, but that's how it works. So you could just be in a, um, creating an oxidative stress from your overall diet and from your ex exercise patterns. And um, I hope that's, that's ans answered it, but really focus on your diet 
and um, cut all fruit out of your diet, Every, all fruit, for at least 60 days until your next level and see if that doesn't have a direct impact on your LDL. Now, it's going to take some time, probably at least three months, to see this drop in your LDL numbers. Um, but but keep me informed. This is a you know very interesting, and it, it is truly directly related to diet. Um, with that, I'm going to close. These were all very very good questions, and I think uh, there's a lot of people that will probably benefit from these from these questions. Uh, with that, I'm going to close. Keep the questions coming in, and we'll be back.